All right. Good morning, everybody. Is it warm enough for you? Or <laughs> I'm sure it'll be 95 degrees tomorrow, right? That's a inside Atlanta joke. Um, but anyway, how's everyone doing? Once we get the music turned down a little bit, we can get started. Hopefully that will be soon. Turn it down a little. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, is that, that was over there, Justin? Let's see. Okay, is that it? All right. All right, let's try again. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Kenneth Gaucher, and I'm the MC, I guess, for today. And um, so I think everyone should have a, a, a packet um, in front of you to break down the agenda for today. I'm definitely happy that, to see all of you here. Um, it's one thing to brave through the cold uh, and brave through um, Atlanta traffic. So uh, you all get double props for being here for such a special occasion. Um, I want to make sure that um, I get my, 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 my boss up to the stage, um, President David Thomas. He, he has another engagement, so he can't be able to stay the whole time, but um, he rearranged his schedule to make sure that he could be here um, to uh, join this celebration. So, uh, Dr. Thomas. As you will find out throughout the day, the most important person in this endeavor is Dr. Gaucher. Because he gave me the weakest introduction anybody's ever given me. <laughs> so he's, he is obviously trying to get me in and out so that you guys can get on with the usual work. You know, it, you know it's. It's not quite that music plays when I usually get introduced, but there's usually some kind of warm up. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> Kinda. <laughs> but uh, that said, Dr. Gaucher does not have to worry uh, because just to give you a sense of his leadership here at the college, uh, we just uh, this last promotion cycle uh, promoted him to the highest rank that you can be uh, on the Morehouse faculty, which is to be a full professor. Um, and uh, his leadership in this effort is also, I think, part of the journey that uh, uh, I believe there are no accidents in the universe, and there's no accident that uh, he's uh, the leadership at Morehouse in this journey because it turns out we had to dig deep to make the case to promote him. And it turns out that um, he has mentored more African Americans who have gone on to get PhDs in, the computer in computer science in the last decade and a half than any other individual uh, in the United States. So you are in good hands. Um, uh, my, my remarks will be brief, uh, if for no other reason than I'm just getting back in the country, um, and we rearranged my schedule so that I could, um, be here, uh, this morning. And I'll just start by saying that as president of Morehouse College, in any given hour, uh, I can be at least three other places. Uh, those are the demands on, on my schedule, if not the schedule of any president. And uh, the main criteria I use to decide where it's important for me to show up is where there is something happening that brings together two things. Um, the strength and values and mission of Morehouse uh, and impacting the way that the 21st century will evolve. Uh, my goal 
uh, as president is that uh, people will, we've been here 100, we've been on the planet 155 years uh, delivering our mission in service to the world, I think. My job is to do my part to make sure we're here in another, another 155 years. And in particular, uh, that um, we have an impact on the 21st century equal to the impact that Morehouse had on the 20th century. And the reality is, I believe, you can't write the history of the 20th century without writing about Morehouse. And it's not just because you can't write it without writing about Martin Luther King. And we gave the world Martin Luther King. Some people say the world knows us because of Martin Luther King. We like to say without us, there would be no king. Um, and those of you who will engage with Morehouse in this joint endeavor uh, will meet many of our students and I think by the end uh, you will have the experience I have every day when I get up and walk to work where I think to myself there are 2200 young men on this campus one of them will be my king. Uh, you will meet someone who will you will say to yourself he could be our king. Um, and uh, our kings take many different forms, uh, not just preachers. Um, we are one of the leading schools that has produced black men with PhDs in the computer sciences. Um, uh, I forget which survey said we were number one, but I have a colleague at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Freeman Rabowski, who some of you may knew, no, Freeman tells me that they're counting wrong, that he's actually now ahead of us, so we, so we debate that. But let me just say that, um, you know, what comes together in this um, work represented by you all being here, I think is um, a joint recognition that um, the future will be driven, one of the forces that will drive the future will be technology. It has already transformed the way we think about the world. Um, and, you know, I was born in 1956. And when I think about the ways in which the world today is a world we could not have imagined 66 years ago, um, I believe that we cannot imagine the world that I, my grandkids and by the way, as you can tell, because I just got off a plane, I'm loose. Uh, I'm getting ready to have my first grandkid. So, so I really do think about, um, you know, if she's born November 16th as planned in 2022, and she lives what we now think will be the average lifespan. I say she because my wife and my daughter have decided it's a she. Uh, but it has not been determined by the doctors. I'm hoping, well, I won't say what I'm hoping, but anyway, right? She'll live to the end of this century. And that century will be shaped by a set of forces. One of them will be technology. Uh, Another will be the life sciences. And the third, I believe, will be culture. And so, you know, uh, in my view, the, 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 the aims that are represented in the Center for Broadening Participation in Computing is really about who will shape the 21st century. And what we also know is that communities that are left out of that will not thrive, some will not survive. Uh, Martin Luther King had a dream. Uh, I don't want us to look up at the end of this century and have a nightmare. And, and that nightmare is that communities of color, the black community in particular, 
will almost be relegated to what we have done to the indigenous people who were here before the Europeans came. There'll be reservations that nobody thinks about of people who have limited participation in what will drive the value creation and the quality of life uh, through the 21st century. And so I want to thank all of you, uh, our partners with ITI uh, or through ITI, uh, for joining and inviting us uh, into this uh, journey together to broaden participation in computing, in technology. Um, and, you know, we narrowly define things oftentimes so we can get, and I, I serve on a few corporate boards, you know, so we can get the folks on our corporate board to sign the check that makes it happen. Uh, so you can't go to your board and say, uh, you know, what this work is really about is creating what Martin Luther King called the beloved community in the 21st century. Nobody will write you a check for that. So we gotta say it's about computing. But I think if we go at this, this work of making technology a place that really represents the broad swaths of our society and engages those individuals in trying to solve the biggest problems of our society, which cannot be solved without technology. Um, we have a greater chance of creating the beloved community than if we go at it as if it's only about, you know, what side of political divides do you belong on? Politicians don't solve problems. They make policies that shape how others of us can engage those problems, but they don't solve them. They get solved on the ground uh, by inventive, entrepreneurial uh, uh, kinds of people uh, who we bring into these spheres of, uh, of influence. So um, again, um, they, they, uh, I walked in, they handed me a file with everything I was supposed to say. I didn't say any of it. So, so they're going to have to figure out how to pivot. I think I was supposed to mention every partner. I apologize that I did not. Um, there, are, there are many here. Uh, I know I had at least uh, one or two meetings with some of you uh, who are on the, uh, uh, the ITI team that helped to bring this together. Um, and again, um, I think that uh, this work is much more important than uh, even some of you may have thought when you walked in the door this morning. So yeah, I see my job is joining us all to the mission that is bigger than any one of us, uh, any two of us, and that goes outside of this room. And so with that, um, I'll just say thank you and give my apologies to Dr. Gaucher and those who have organized this, who are sitting there saying, he didn't say, we, we stayed up all night, I see. Jasmine in the back, you know, she's probably thinking, I stayed up all night writing those remarks for him. He didn't use any of them. <laughs> but, uh, but I just wanted to tell you what I think is important for you to hear from me. Um, and also to say that on the Morehouse side, um, we are fully committed to this effort. Um, we get invited to do lots of things and we choose judiciously. Uh, and our choice to engage this has very much been influenced by our experience <clears throat> that at each successive conversation, uh, the ITI representatives have made clear that they are fully committed. Uh, and we, we, we even have in our strategic plan one pillar called Partnerships of Purpose, which is lots of people ask us to do stuff with them but we need to choose those where we have common purpose because that's what will sustain us beyond the moment. So thank you.
and uh, you'll have a great day, and maybe I'll be able to drop in. <coughs> Is there lunch? Oh, yeah. So hopefully I'll be able to drop in and see, <coughs> see you guys at lunch. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, he's, um, he, he could have said more, um, but he's a very humble guy um, on how much he's worked behind the scenes to um, enable this thing to come to fruition. Um, academia is a very interesting and special place, and um, he's, he's, he's done a lot behind the scenes that he probably can't say on the microphone to support me and, and support this effort and to put Morehouse in this special space where we think we can be leaders. Um, and so I'm, I'm very thankful for that um, and uh, appreciate that. And so want to um, have some speakers come up. And the first one, well, the second one is um, Jason Oxman, who, uh oh, over here. <laughs> Who's the president and CEO of the IT Industry Council. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gauthier. Great to see you again. Great to be here with you. Thank you to Dr. Thomas for the opportunity to launch this partnership today. Um, Jasmine, uh, Dr. Thomas's remarks are still up here. Do you want me to just go ahead and read those? Or um, I have some too, but uh, I can cover them both if you, uh, if you prefer. Um, it is a true honor and a pleasure uh, to be here uh, at Morehouse College. It's exciting to be here uh, during homecoming. Uh, the campus has some electricity to it. Uh, which is particularly uh, invigorating, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the winter temperatures uh, here. Um, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of ITI. Uh, we share uh, the enthusiasm and the excitement of the entire Morehouse team. It's great to be back here on campus uh, launching uh, the IAB, which I'll talk about in just a second. But I want to particularly thank uh, Dr. Thomas and, and Provost Dr. Brown, Dr. Gaucher, and the entire Morehouse team who have been uh, enthusiastic partners as we prepare for this momentous day, uh, and we recognize the particular honor and, frankly, the particular challenge that we have and the responsibility we have of being partnered with such a storied institution as Dr. Uh, Thomas talked about. The history of Morehouse College over a century and a half uh, is one that we have a proud opportunity uh, to help move forward together in partnership. Uh, and we take that responsibility seriously. And I and the fellow speakers are here today to talk about the work that we're going to do to fulfill the mission uh, of Morehouse. I'm here today with a terrific team from ITI, uh, Gordon Bitko, Megan Peterson, Rhoda Washington, who have been responsible for putting this all together. I'm also pleased to be here uh, today uh, with the vice chair of our board of directors, James Hayes from Tenable, and the newest member of our board of directors, Tracy Owens, who is uh, a Morehouse man himself uh, here in Atlanta on behalf of Sage Networks. Um, I'm here uh, to not only thank uh, those volunteer leaders at ITI that have helped us uh, bring this partnership uh, to fruition, but also to thank all of the ITI member companies, uh, more than a dozen of them, that are participating in this important initiative. And they're participating uh, in this initiative because for the tech industry, nothing is more important than people. People make innovation possible. It's not, there's a tendency in the tech industry to think about the innovations as the machines and the equipment and the software and the security that, uh, that the tech industry provides. It's the people that make all that possible. And so nothing is more important to the tech industry than the pipeline of people that are going to create that next great generation of innovative products and services. And that's what we're here to talk about today. ITI is a, a, a storied organization ourselves. We're about half a century uh, younger than, uh, than Morehouse. But we are 106 years old, founded in 1916. One of our founding member companies is actually headquartered here uh, in Atlanta, NCR then known as National Cash Register. But we are 106 years later today, representative of a broader technology industry. Every company, it seems, uh, is a technology company. But we're very focused uh, on advancing innovation, advancing new technologies that benefit society, that help people around the world, that help grow economies, that help promote innovation. And we believe in a diverse and inclusive workforce because of the power of that innovation uh, in society. So uh, I'm here today to play a part in the announcement of the ITI Morehouse Partnership, which is realized through the creation of a first-of-its-kind innovation advisory board. 
Um, the Innovation Advisory Board is really designed to be a catalyst for a transformational collaboration between the technology industry and its workforce, its present and future workforce, and historically black universities and colleges like Morehouse uh, and BIPOC serving institutions. Uh, innovation, as I mentioned, depends on diverse voices and experiences across all industries. And in order to achieve the full potential of that innovation and the full potential of the tech industry, we have to develop a diverse and robust workforce here in the United States that capitalizes on the incredible potential for careers in science and technology and engineering and related fields. By 2025, our industry, the technology industry, will have three and a half million open jobs here in the US. But because of the lack of applicants for those jobs, we have a very real risk, according to recent reports, that two million of those jobs will go unfilled. So what do we need to do? We need to start here, we need to start locally, and we need to start with the 50% of black professionals who graduate from HBCUs in the US every year including the top talent graduating here uh, at Morehouse, and connecting them to the millions of available jobs across the technology industry. So to do this, the Innovation Advisory Board is gonna leverage the expertise of the world's leading technology companies, the members of ITI, who make up our membership, and further the educational offerings here at Morehouse to help prepare the Morehouse man for the job of the future. So through curriculum and faculty development, through fellowships and a direct recruitment pipeline, we're gonna equ help equip students with the skills, the practical experiences, the know-how, and to become the leaders, the next generation of leaders in the technology industry. We're also gonna connect ITI member company expertise with Morehouse leadership uh, and educators to develop innovative technology degree programs that can be a pipeline for recruitment from technology companies, designing career pathways specifically for students from marginalized communities. It's also gonna help set the future direction of the cyber workforce to ensure that that workforce has robust participation from all segments of society, all perspective, and, and all voices. That's why we're excited for the opportunity to influence the tech and cyber workforce of the future at the federal, state, and local governments across the US, including the participation of Colonel Tony Rinnick, who you'll hear from uh, in a moment, the CIO of the state of New York. And we're honored that the board is gonna participate in this brand new Center for Broadening Participation in Computing. It's a real opportunity for us to help that succeed. Within that center, as uh, Dr. Thomas mentioned, uh, we will see, uh, through the support of ITI member companies, technical experience and real world experience come together so educators can help the Morehouse curriculum develop career and degree pathways to the future. So after today's launch, immediately after today's launch, starting with the first meeting of the IAB here on campus, the curriculum development and the coursework development will get underway. And with the unveiling of the new Innovation Advisory Board, it's comprehensive and clear action that is going to move this work forward. In addition to leveraging and bringing forward our industry's expertise, ITI is also proud to provide financial support to the launch of the center and we are particularly proud to announce that today as the center gets underway. So, so in partnership with our member companies and ITI and Morehouse and the support we're announcing today, our goal is to help encourage the technology industry writ large to make these kind of investments, to make these kind of engagements a reality. They're strategic, they're sustained, and they have minority serving institutions best interests at heart. That is the most important part of the work we're doing together today. So on behalf of the global tech industry, we look forward to helping advance this effort. We look forward to seeing its success move forward, not only at Morehouse, but also at HBCUs across the country. We are particularly proud to be here today. We thank the Morehouse executive leadership from Dr. Thomas, Provost Brown, Dr. Gaucher, and all the others we have worked with uh, over the course of this program and look forward to continuing to support this important initiative. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Jason mentioned some really awesome things and um, get your popcorn ready. This is a lot of great stuff that's gonna come out. 
uh, with this center, and I'm, I'm glad you're here to, to celebrate it. Um, our next speaker is going to be um, a new friend of mine. Um, have a lot of things in common and um, have, have grown close and have learned a lot um, since we met each other. Um, Angelo Tony, uh, retired Colonel Angelo Tony Reddick. Thank you and good morning. You know, about 40 years ago as a first lieutenant at Fort Lewis, Washington, I was tasked with the job of coaching an Army football team. Saying a lot almost, but it was a football team just the same. And my theme for that coaching experience was class and character. I share that with you because I want to remind Dr. Thomas that just a few weeks ago at the Morehouse Howard University game, I was invited to his suite. And I was positioned in a, in a seat that was facing directly in the sun. And when I complained about it, when I look into my rear, a gentleman said, well, why don't you come up here and sit beside me? I said, well, thank you very much, sir. And I didn't realize that was Dr. Thomas. It reflected on my theme about class and character and what Morehouse men produce. Being a graduate of Albany State College at the time, in 1983, I set out on a path to become successful. But I knew as I took that journey, I was responsible for one thing, and that's leaving a legacy. In my fraternity, we call it lifting as we climb. As the Chief Information Officer of New York State, I'm responsible for managing a workforce of over 3,400 employees, technical employees. I share that with you because I look at technology as a broad scope of responsibilities. When I met Gordon and Rhoda at a National Association of State CIOs meeting uh, several months ago, they were having a discussion about developing a board to support Morehouse College. I wanted to be a part of that. They said that they were emphasizing the need to bring STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, into the curriculum to enforce or at least provide the groundwork for Morehouse students to be successful. I decided I wanted to be the antagonist. I said that why are we focusing only on STEM and not producing the class and character of an individual at Morehouse that is all encompassing? Because I know as a senior leader in technology, and before this I was the CIO of the Virgin Islands, don't smile, that wasn't a good experience. It was a great place to be, but I was there when the hurricanes hit. For three years, we recovered. So I've worked in this industry for quite a few years. My last 15 years, I spent as a technologist, a cybersecurity professional, an Army information technology expert, and a professor at the National Defense University. So I have a great appreciation of what it takes to make IT leaders. And as an antagonist on the board, I want to make sure that we do not pigeonhole or add blocks to individuals who don't want to major in science, technology, engineering, and math. Because more than anything, Morehouse makes leaders. And all IT professionals do not have to be engineers or mathematicians. We have to balance our act as we look at our students and give them opportunities and let them know that 40 some odd years ago when I was in college, I took my first COBOL programming <laughs> class, and I can guarantee you I would never work in the IT industry. I could guarantee you, as a football player, airborne ranger, I had no aspirations of working in the tech industry until I was professionally embarrassed by a colonel who said, turn the computer on and print that out. <laughs> and on the computer show, C prompt backslash greater than. And I was determined that day that I would never be embarrassed or never be blocked from an opportunity. So I think as an antagonist on this board, I want to make sure that we emphasize in the portfolio of classes that we're looking for leaders. And it takes a special breed of student to understand technology, the enterprise. It is the enterprise, not just cybersecurity, not just network management, but it's also human resource management. Being able to find that individual and bring them on the staff to contribute to the enterprise. Governor Hochul gave me an order to hire 400 more individuals. I'm excited, but I don't want to pigeonhole myself and say, I just need programmers. I need no code, low code, MFA, zero trust, people that understand how to declare a variable. No, I need workers. I need workers with class and character. 
that have aspirations to branch out. So as an antagonist on the board, I want to make sure that we specialize in those endeavors as well as we offer leadership classes to our students. So Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for that seat and thank you for an opportunity to work with you in Morehouse College. What Dr. Gaucher didn't say is 20 years before I joined the fraternity over 40 years ago, he became a member of my chapter at Albany State University. And when I saw him in the program, I said, I know that young man, but I didn't know he was as bright and industrious as he is. And I compliment you for being that man. You got a leader. Jason, thank you. Gordon, Rhoda, thank you. Thank you to this group of Morehouse professionals, class and character. Thank you for those kind words. Um, this uh, smart brother there. And um, I'm definitely learning a lot. And his antagonism is, is uh, truly a, a very special and um, part of this board, in addition to the 80 tech companies. Uh, <laughs> um, and definitely value that. Um, I want to introduce our next speaker, um, who has um, come to the rescue. <laughs> to, 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 to fill a, a, a slot and to uh, bring a perspective um, for the partnership for the center, um, Boz Bell, who serves as the corporate account manager um, and sales specialist for HP. So <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Gaucher, Dr. Thomas, and everyone for, for hosting us here today. Um, so many very bright and insightful comments have been made up to this point. And uh, my goal is to kind of share with you a little bit about HP's perspective on partnering in this space. I'm going to try and lock this microphone down first. The first thing I'd like to do is kind of share with you a little bit about HP, who we are as a company. For those of you who are kind of new to the tech space, you may know us as the print company, and that's great. Um, do a lot in the PC space as well. But really, where it all starts is at Stanford University, a couple of students started a business more than 80 years ago. And that first company was the founding company in Silicon Valley. It shaped um, what we know as the tech industry today. If you've seen the Steve Jobs uh, story, you've seen that Steve Wozniak worked at HP. Um, we uh, brilliantly decided that that PC business wasn't going anywhere. So decided to kind of let him take his creation with Jobs and let that walk out the door. There's lots of great uh, images where uh, a young Bill Gates met with uh, Bill and Dave, the founders of HP, and they gave him a, a, sh a, sh a shot, right, if you will, with his new operating system and kind of, you know, that kind of launched that business. Um, we've been around for a long time. There's one concept, it's called the HP way, that really kind of shapes how we go about doing business. And it's basically the idea that companies exist to do more than provide um, uh, profits to their shareholders, rather they exist to make a difference in the communities where they reside and do business. And that is, at the, that is absolutely at the core of who we are as a company. And I can't stress that enough. When it comes to um, today, we have a concept called sustainable impact inside of HP. And everyone's heard of sustainability. But for us, it means three things. It means a focus on people, obviously the planet. Uh, we've got something like 40 or 50% of all printers on the planet, which is insane if you think about it from the number of trees that are being that are being shoved through those printers. So sustainability is obviously important from a planet perspective, but then also community. Specifically, how can we enable communities to participate in this digital transformation era that we're all living in? The digital divide, as everyone knows, is very real. And as we heard from Dr. Thomas, there's a very real possibility that some communities could be left behind in a massive way as we think about the transition into the fourth industrial revolution and what the impacts of that might mean going forward. So from a sustainability perspective, we have really leaned in on this concept of tackling the digital divide, tackling um, the diversification of the tech sector, right, which is super important to us. And we have launched a number of programs over the last several years to try and help uh, to impact that. One would be a partnership with HBCUs, the HP Business uh, Challenge with the HBCU Business Dean's Roundtable, which is awesome. Another is the H, 
uh, BCU Technology Conference presented by HP in partnership with our sponsors, Microsoft and Intel. Has anyone ever heard of any of these, these activities? No? All right, look for us next year with the HBCU Technology Conference. We will be rocking and rolling again for the third year, which, which is very exciting. The theme of the last two years conference is digital transformation. And you know, I've heard some comments and they were made and I cannot, I, I, wish, I wish there was a, like a giant exclamation mark that I could put over the head of Dr. Thomas as he was making the statements. Make no mistake about it. We are living in amazing times where digital transformation concepts and this idea are going to transform every single business on the planet, every single way in which we interact with everything. And there are gonna be those folks who lean in early and are able to benefit and realize you know, the potentials that go along with that. And then there's gonna be those folks who don't. This partnership with ITI is an opportunity for Morehouse College to lead the charge for HBCUs in moving black folks into this space, right? In a way that we've not been able to in the past. And the way I like to think of it is, you know, for the first industrial revolution, we were obviously occupied in um, doing other things. The second industrial revolution, we weren't able to participate in that either. The third, yeah, 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 yeah. Not, not so much there either. But the fourth, which is where we are right now, I explain it this way, every single dollar on the planet is up for grabs through digital transformation. Every dollar, you've got an opportunity right now, right, to lean in in this space, be a leader in this space, whether you major in STEM majors or not, you're looking at a tuba player, right? I can tell you all about the Vaughn Williams tuba concerto, yet I, I contribute significantly into one of the you know, largest tech companies on the planet. And so I would say, this is a great space to be in. It's a beautiful and wonderful time to be alive. Um, and um, you know, I wish you all luck. And looking forward to moving on to the next, next phase. Thank you. I'm glad all the speakers are better than me. Um, that's a good, good thing to, uh, to have on, on your team. Um, next person I want to introduce is uh, been a good uh, mentor first since I was a, a pup, uh, just leaving Albany State and, and going to grad school at Auburn and uh, has been super supportive. Um, been someone I could really talk to, um, great advisor, mentor, um, and friend for a long time, um, who um, happens to be at the National Science Foundation. He wasn't there when I met him, so, um, but it's just worked out that way. Um, and he has some things uh, that I think everyone would want to hear, um, as well as the other speakers. Um, he's currently um, the AD for the Directorate of Education and Human Resources at the National Science Foundation, Dr. James L. Moore III. Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be in your midst. You know, Morehouse has this rich tradition. It's one of the greatest intellectual installations in the country, and, and for some reason, it has a secret. It has the secret formula for developing young men from taking them from the ruins, in some places, taking them where they are, meeting them where they are, um, and doing extraordinary things. So it is great to be on these hollow grounds. It was great to be in your midst. It's great that Morehouse is taking the leadership in this area. Uh, as Dr. Gaucher, I've watched him grow up, and now he's big enough that, you know, I can't take a check from him now but because I work at the government, but nevertheless, <laughs> I remember when he didn't have any money and I could take him out to eat, but nevertheless, <laughs> that's why it's important to develop, to contribute, to cultivate, because this is the tree and he's doing the same thing for others. Each one, reach one. 
At the National Science Foundation, this is my seventh week, and this is my first university that I have come to visit. And so it's a, not only a momentous occasion for Morehouse, it's a momentous occasion for me. At the National Science Foundation, my budget is are over $1.3 billion. And when I first came, I thought I could change the world with $1.3 billion. In fact, my academic home is Ohio State University. And I had probably one of the largest budgets in the country for what I was doing at the university. And I come to realize that budget is dust money compared to being at the National Science Foundation. The problems that we are confronted as a society are so massive. We have many grand challenges that we are confronted, not only in these United States, across the world. The communities that are most vulnerable tend to be most impacted by climate, pandemics, See, we live in a time of loss. That's what I like to frame the pandemic. Many of us lost loved ones. We lost time. We lost our senior year. We lost our prom. We lost things that made us humane. But STEM is an important driver for change economic and social mobility. See, at the National Science Foundation, when I heard about this position, I saw the position. It was underwhelming, to be honest, when I saw it. Then I went to the website, and I began to see all the different things that this directorate was making strategic investments in. And then I went to see some YouTubes, like the young folks, to see what my director, Dr. Puncha Nathan, was saying. See, we're vigilant in the National Science Foundation in our quest to make STEM more accessible, inclusive, and diverse. More specifically, we aim to reach the missing millions across the United States who have not been cultivated and developed for the many immense opportunities available in the STEM enterprise. Broadening participation is one of our core values. The foundation has long invested in expanding opportunities to people who have historically been underrepresented, or underdeveloped, and undercultivated. Throughout my career, I grew up about three hours from here. If you drive really fast on I-85, <laughs> you go to a little area. I'm from South Carolina. And if you see the BMW plant there, my wife grew up 10 minutes from there, and my, I grew up 15 minutes there. See, I grew up in a mill community. And we experienced in the 80s work disappearing, going offshores. I saw families and communities that thrived, but when work disappeared, I saw communities struggle. The BMW plant, when it came in the area, it's a case example of what STEM can do. I saw property go up from $1,000 an acre to $20,000 an acre. I saw subsidiaries build around this major corporate enterprise. See. You can go all across America, the Black Belt of Alabama, the Delta region of Mississippi, Arkansas, or even Appalachia. Those parts of the country 
have been left behind. Parents and members of those communities want the same things that my parents wanted for their children. You can go into Youngstown, Ohio, where I am. Youngstown is not the same place that it used to be. You can go in Gary, Indiana, or Chester, PA. These used to be the migration places that many of us in the South, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, that we fled to to leave the cotton fields, tobacco fields of the South. And it created economic opportunities. It raises, raised families to levels that they had never been before. At the National Science Foundation, we created a new directory called Technology, Innovation, and Partnerships. We're doing things that we've never did before. We're going to make investments that are longer and bigger. For example, what we call our regional engines. $160 million, 10 years, as a way to foster economic development and to foster innovation in some of our STEM areas. It's an exciting time to be at the National Science Foundation. See, I'm James Moore III. My son is the fourth, and I went, as soon as I got on this campus, I was summoned to go to the bookstore because my son thinks he wants to be a Morehouse man. He would choose a place that his daddy's gonna have to write a big check. <laughs> and I told him he got three other kids coming right behind him. But I've seen the beauty. I've hired graduate students who worked in my center from Spelman and Morehouse. And I've seen individuals who have a cultivated mind. And you always can tell a Morehouse man, right? You can tell when you see him, you can smell him and you can hear him. <laughs> but nevertheless, my son thinks this is what he wants, so I went and made a donation, I guess, by buying some of their paraphernalia, because it wasn't cheap. <laughs> so, like everyone here today, my NSF colleagues and I want the nation's workforce to better reflect our population and to welcome diverse thoughts, ideas, this, is new compute, this new computing center will help make this dream a reality by engaging communities that have not always been adequately included in the STEM enterprise. In my mind, STEM is a human right. It's not only a moral imperative, but it's an economic imperative. I see STEM as a catalyst for economic prosperity. Broadening participation in computing at Morehouse can be an economic avenue for so many students and families. Let me say this. A person who's been engaged in higher education, and I don't shy away from this, anyone who care to hear about it, I am concerned about the cost of a college, of educa a college education in America. College goes up 6% annually, higher than the inflation rate, around 3%. Low income, vulnerable people will begin to make decisions that may compromise our ability to be a global leader in the STEM enterprise. But it's not just low income families. It's middle income families who are equally having challenging times. But I am happy to say, in my directory, we fund projects called IFS STEM for those students who are low income, pale elder. They can get up to $10,000. It's a 100% chance you won't get an investment in NSF if you don't submit a grant application. There's resources in abundance all across the agency, i.e., the Education and Human Resources Directorate. 
We also know that all advanced placement in K-12 is not created equally. We know that you can go into southern Georgia, the class settings, the opportunities may not look like it does in Decatur, Georgia. See, something fundamentally wrong when a young person takes everything that is available to them in their community. See, my, my children, they lease their rooms. I correct them when they say, my room. <laughs> I correct them when they say, their cell phone. It's my cell phone. <laughs> See, my, it's important for us to recognize my children did have, had no control over the zip codes that they live in, the parents, their relatives. But in America, we keep rewarding privilege. And by the way, if my son doesn't do what he needs to, daddy doesn't pay for college, he helps with college. See. It's important for us to think about this. Too many young people are foreclosing on STEM opportunities because of cost. Because at most universities, it costs more for a STEM degree than it does for a non-STEM degree, if you didn't know that, because of the fees. In most K-12 settings in, around the country, Sometimes the highest mathematics course you can take might be Algebra 2. That won't even get you into the state's flagship institution. We need to hold people accountable, and we got to stop waiting for Superman to come. But we need a government intervention but the government alone is not enough. We need collaborations with our colleagues because one of the things I realized with the 1.3 billion, by the way, it's really about 270 million that I have to play with because over a billion dollars is congressionally mandated. So it's already earmarked. But one of those earmarks is specifically for HBCUs. One of those earmarks is specifically for tribal uh, universities. One of those earmarks is specifically for Hispanic serving institutions. The agency understands, regardless of what you hear around the country, where people are afraid of rollbacks around affirmative action, the federal government has been, has maintained its resolve that we must invest in communities that we traditionally have not invested in. Corporate America saying they're looking for talent and diversity because we have to. Because in cybersecurity, my wife is a cybersecurity engineer. If you're foreign born in some in different places of the world, you won't be able to access those opportunities. It's important that we begin to think about this. While I'm grateful to be here, to represent EHR, I'm full by just being in your presence. Looking at you is the looking glass self that my parents used to tell me the same things that I tell my own children, that I didn't have no control of my zip code, and some of the things that I thought was mine that my dad would tell me it was his. We all have an opportunity. We all have an opportunity to serve. We all have an opportunity to speak truth to power, and sometimes you don't have to say a word. It's your actions. In my career, I have always taken jobs that people believe that we could do nothing. And they spent more time trying to convince me that we could not do anything. At The Ohio State University, I run one of the few centers 
in the country that focus on African American males. We stole everything from Morehouse College, and now Morehouse called <laughs> us. <laughs> in my office, we produced two Rhodes Scholars and two and one um, Truman Scholar. When the university has only produced eleven in its history. See, you got a 100% chance you can't do something if you don't try. And when you grew up in the rural South, it wasn't nothing but time and space, and you dreamed. Now I get to walk the dream. I want to highlight the wonderful work of our colleagues and the directorate that funded the center. And I'm still in some of that thunder, but in many ways, we have our share of funding Morehouse and I looked in our portfolio in abundance, and this guy's getting most of the funding. He's made Morehouse one of the top HBCUs in the country in funding. <laughs> now, I won't lie, because I like talent, and when I was at Ohio State, I was trying to steal it. He's committed. He's committed to this institution. I hope this institution wrap their love and support around him to ensure that he's able to continue to develop professionally so he can in turn to continue to show the world things that they said that could not be done. One person leads the country for black males in computer science. That warrants a hearty round of applause. I'm going to sit down soon. But we done wrote the biggest check, so I, I got a little time. So, so my colleagues in computer information science and engineering is, is a directorate. They funded the Broadening Participation Project, and this project entails Morehouse College as a lead. So let me, let me just tell you something. It's rare that our HBCUs are the lead. Let me say this, it's a rarity that our HBCUs are the leads. It's typically institutions like where I come from are the leads and we absorb a lot of the money, but Morehouse is the lead of Auburn University, University of Florida, and American Institution for Research. That deserves a hearty <laughs> applause. It's extending the work of the Institute for African American Mentoring in Computer Sciences. It's $2.25 million initially, and Morehouse is getting about $1.7 million. Now, my mother always said this, said great minds come from every zip code, great minds come from every institutional type, and this Morehouse is a living example of this. Dr. Gaucher, who organized this exceptional event today, let's continue to love on him because guess what? When you leave, that's when all the time they say, where's everybody now? But we need to continue to support him, and I've shared with my colleagues at NSF, we want to come and find out how we can be supported. See, we don't give grants at NSF. We make investments. We fund, we make investments in PIs who's gonna help us realize our noble mission at the National Science Foundation. So the agency does not give out charity. We fund about uh, 12 to 15% of the projects that are funded throughout the agency. We receive over 40,000 applications to say how fortunate you are, we are to have Dr. Gaucher is, is an understatement. I want to close with this. I want to extend my deepest gratitude to everyone who invited me. But I'm from South Carolina, and you probably hear it from my voice. And to me, one of the greatest educators of the 20th century is from my beloved South Carolina. And many of you all probably know who he is. To me, he's the greatest architect of developing young people, but more specifically, black men. And his name is Dr. Benjamin E. Mays. 
He was born in the same county where my grandmother was born. And my mentor in the academy was the Benjamin E. Mays professor at the University of South Carolina, and he was the first black full professor at the University of South Carolina since the reconstruction of the South. And Dr. May says this, whatever you do, you do it so good that no man dead, alive, or yet to be born can do it better. That's the level of excellence we want Dr. Gaucher to continue to strive for, and that's the level of effort that we want each one of you to put into broadening participation. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, dear words. Uh, a lot of free game over the years. I used to talk to my, my mom. See, I used to talk to my mom and, and, and tell her all the things that, oh, Dr. Moore told me this. Oh, he told me that. You know, I learned this, I learned that. So uh, I was definitely excited to get all that wisdom um, over the years. And, and, and uh, you definitely had a, a, a part in, in the success I've had at Morehouse. Um, I'm very appreciative. I want to call. Um, I know everybody smelled that chicken, so I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> carry things on, but uh, I want to let two more people speak. Um, one good friend of mine, Corey Hawkins, who is the Director of Universal Relationship, of University Relations at Morehouse. Thank you, Dr. Gaucher. And um, yeah, as you said, I know everyone's hungry, so I'm going to be brief. Um, when this guy calls me, I, I come. I don't know how to code. I am not a computer person. But I am proud to represent Microsoft here with a number of my colleagues. I'm on a team uh, called University Relations, and we work to strengthen our partnership with a number of schools. I particularly work with a number of HBCUs, including Morehouse, Spelman, and Clark Atlanta here in the, in the AUC. Also a proud Morehouse grad, so happy homecoming to the Spellhouse family. Um, I've been in this role for just over a little under two years, and um, one of my key partners is this guy back here. Uh, we've been able to, uh, you know, I think, create a lot of projects together, and we want to continue to do that. Um, it's important to Microsoft. One of our missions is really to um, empower everyone in the planet to do more. And part of that, you know, that, that goal and that is for us to work all across universities in many different areas. And so we recognize the importance of uh, coming together with partners like Dr. Gaucher and other people from industry, academia, the community, um, to really kind of reinforce this opportunity that un and make sure that underrepresented people can have access to these opportunities. Um, one of the things I love about my job is that I'm not in recruiting. I, uh, you know, we want to recruit the talent, but we understand that it's also important before we get to the point of recruiting to actually build these partnerships and to support people and make sure that students and faculty can grow uh, their capacity, and th that's what we're here to do. Um, so we are really proud. I want to acknowledge all my colleagues from Microsoft, um, from different parts of the company who um, add to my engagement with the schools that I work with. We could not do it without you. Um, and so thank you. It's, it's great to be here and continue to uh, call on me when you need something. Before you leave, before you leave, uh, I think you left something uh, back here. So, so I, I was going to pull out my corporate card and pay you that way, but I see you have it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for Corey, his team, and, and Microsoft, who uh, has a brand spanking new building right across the street from me. Um, and their effort to come to Atlanta and bring technology opportunities and, and collaborate with the center. And so uh, some startup funding is, is great and I appreciate uh, him and his team for everything they do and, and look forward to uh, going in partnership with Microsoft. Thank you so much. So I have saved the best for last. Uh, a good friend of mine who we've been collaborating for a while now, um, who's representing a company, and I, I don't want to steal her thunder, but um, 
very critical to this piece when we talk about exposure for uh, students in tech. I think it's a big misconception um, about what the barriers are and um, Portia here knows all about those barriers and one of those big barriers is um, the technical interview process. And so I'm happy to have uh, Portia come and speak and say some words and uh, her support of the center and her role as Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at CARE. Thank you so much, Dr. Gaucher. I am delighted to be here this afternoon and I will tell you that my journey in STEM began several years ago. Uh, and I am, have always been committed to the pipeline. So when I was at Xerox, when we took basically a, a, we went from having big copiers to desktop copiers, I was at IBM when we launched our very first personal computer, and I was at Sprint when we launched our first cell phone. One of the things that I've noticed throughout my entire career is I've been one of few who've been in the room. Uh, whether, and, and most of my jobs have been in sales, so there were even fewer. And it's always been a concern of mine to make sure that we have a continuous pipeline, that we share the knowledge with one another and not believe that it's a secret, that, I don't, that now that I'm here, that I don't want any others, that now that I made it to the top, I don't want anybody else to challenge my position and so one of the things that I was fortunate to do is to work with a, uh, a young man who, as a matter of fact, came out of Microsoft. I met him when I was at, uh, I, I, I actually quit my job at Sprint uh, and started my own search firm and consulting firm. And when one of my customers, Verizon, had asked me uh, to do some work at, the, at, at Wharton. I met a young man there who later became an executive uh, with Xbox at Microsoft. He started a company uh, in Seattle in 2015. Uh, he knew how committed I was to diversity. He happened to be, um, uh, he and his partner, as a matter of fact, his partner worked, uh, the co-founder worked for Melinda Gates, so he had been used to giving. One was uh, an Indian guy, one was a white guy, but there was no one there who looked like me. So they asked me to come and be a part of the team when there were less than 15 of us. Within 30 days on the job, I realized that one of the things that we were doing, the company itself was called Carat, K-A-R-A-T, and they were actually doing first round interviews for people who were hiring software engineers. I thought, well, this is great. This is wonderful. And we were doing some practice interviews with students from not only Stanford, but USC Monterey Bay. And I thought, well, none of them look like me. So I wanted to make sure that there were some students that looked like me who were going through our practice interviews. And so I went both to Morehouse as well as to Howard, and I realized that our students did not pass the assessments to get the job at an Apple, at a Facebook, at a Microsoft, at these big fang companies that they desire to be at because there was a gatekeeper and that gatekeeper was the actual interview. And so I realized that we had to do something. And it actually started right here at Morehouse where I was able to go into the room of a professor and talk with the students and say, what is it that you need? What is it that I can bring you that's not just, you know, sometimes we, we don't know what we don't know. I, as I took Morehouse men out to dinner and they bragged about how much they were going to make, uh, they said, you know, oh, I'm going to make, as a software engineer, I want to make $90,000. The gentleman that I was sitting there with who helped fund my, my idea, uh, he was from Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And I asked him to tell the young men how much money a brand new student graduating was making out in Silicon Valley and it was 135 to 145. And the young man looked at me and said, I don't even know anybody who makes $100,000 a year. And I said, oh, but yes, you do. Because you, had, you know me and you know Maurice. So there, there, there starts your village. And so over the years, what I realized is that we needed to do technical interview workshops because many of them didn't even know what a technical interview was. 
So when the career services department comes in and they prepare you for an interview, they're preparing you for not a technical one. It's a behavioral interview. So when our young men step up with their suit and tie and they're faced with, here's a technical interview, they are floored because they're not prepared. And all of a sudden, it's like a deer in the headlights. And what happens? They don't get the job. And then they feel that, what I call, my, my old days at IBM, we called it fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Fear that I'm even going to be able to get the job. I'm uncertain that I'm going to pass the test. And I doubt that they even want me because of who, what I look like. And so there is so much that they have to overcome. And when you have parents back at home, and not every parent is able to pay for them to go to school, so some of the parents are saying, I don't know why you don't come back here, because your cousin Leroy, he's working over at Amazon. They're paying $15 an hour. I don't know why you're thinking you're going to be at Morehouse because you can't afford it. Bring your booty on back home. And the students are saying, but I want to stay here, Ms. Portia. I want to become that software engineer. But they don't have the support. So even when they do graduate, they don't know that they can't live in San Francisco for $90,000. That Ms. Porsche has to find them a place, hopefully, fingers crossed, mm -hmm. you know, over in Oakland, and hopefully it's, it's someplace decent. But the, the point is that it started here at Morehouse. The idea of me being able to give back to the students, not only the workshops, but also free technical interviews. But the caveat was it came with feedback. So many of us, all of us in the room have, take, have, have done interviews, but you haven't gotten that feedback to know how well you did or didn't do. And that's what we were able to do with the students. And when we first started, uh, I called it an adopt-a-school program, and that's how I sold it to Priscilla Chan. I will need you to adopt a school. And I said, well, let's go to, go to Howard. And the guy said, no, I'm a Morehouse man. No, we're going to Morehouse. <laughs> I said, well, let's go to Morehouse. So that's how we ended up right here at Morehouse. Uh, Priscilla Chan was here on the campus as well uh, at, over at Spelman doing great things. And I look back on how many years ago that was. Uh, someone asked me about how we even came up with the name. And the name of our program is called, uh, and it was named by Morehouse men and some Howard students because they got a choice. I wanted to, I, I called it adopt a school program. That d didn't sound as fancy as it could have. So I went with a, uh, an agency, a black agency, who, a marketing agency that came up with three names. And so I thought, I'm not going to choose, I'm going to let the students choose. And 100% of them chose the name Brilliant Black Minds. And that's the name of the program. And so in 2020, let's see, in 2020, we actually named the program Brilliant Black Minds. But what we realized is that so many students didn't have the opportunity. And so today, what I want to do is, you know, partner with Dr. Gaucher, who I've been partnering with for a couple of years, but to give even more, because I think it's important. Because some of our students, even when they are given an opportunity to do interviews, they are afraid to do them. And we realize that the more interviews they do, the more comfortable they get. And when we can give them to them again and again and again, and there's no limit that they're going to be successful, they're going to be very confident, especially when they're going in for that interview their senior year. Uh, and so today, I'm proud to say that we're going to give 1,000 interviews for the new Center for Broadening Participation in Computing. Now, And, and what does that really mean? It's like, wh wh how much money is that really? We're talking about $400,000. And so that's what we're committed to doing the very first year. And so we want them to take full advantage of it. And I will tell you, Dr. Gaucher, if you run out, I got your back. So you don't have to worry about it. But I, I am thrilled to be here, to be continue to be a partner at Morehouse, because I know the work that Dr. Gaucher does and the other professors here is so important to building that pipeline of talent that is needed at all the companies that are partnering here. But most importantly, we've got to start with our own 
and make sure that they have the tools that they need in order to be successful and that it's not a secret. It's, it, I, I live in Kansas, so I'll, you know, the, the whole Dorsey thing, and you look behind the curtain, and all you see is this little bit short white man. That's basically what it is in software engineering. It is not anything that you have to be so afraid of, but you're always thinking, am I good enough? Because students here said, I didn't think I was smart enough to be a software engineer, Miss Portia, until you came here and you showed me the way. So as they say in church, even if you just touch one, that's all I needed. And that's happy to be here to touch many more. And thank you. All right, so I've been um, signaled to go ahead and, and dismiss. Um, the, the last thing I'll say is I, I really want to thank um, all the folks that helped put this together. I know some people are going to leave after lunch or, or have to go now, and, and, and thank you for coming at all. But I definitely thank uh, my team um, for all the help that they did, and thanks to all my sponsors, a lot of them in the room, that really helped to get us to this place, because if it wasn't for their support, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about later on in the day uh, wouldn't be possible. So definitely thank you all. Uh, and thanks to my, uh, my faculty. I got two of my awesome faculty here, uh, Dr. Evans, Professor Evans, uh, and Professor Forney. Uh, so I'm happy that they're here, uh, that are helping uh, teach these minds. And we're going to expand their, their reach uh, to even grow it even more. So, uh, and thanks to my family members that are here, uh, as well as my mom. My mom. So, uh, thank you for this great uh, birthday present. I turn 40 next month, so that's 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 what's up. So I'm glad to kick it off right, and uh, I won't hold things up, and we'll go to lunch. everyone if we could please make our way to the conference center for lunch and if there are any press questions we're going to ask that you stay and if the speakers can also stay to answer questions from the press so once again lunch is being served if you could please exit the room for those who are with the press you're welcome to stay our speakers we're asking you to stay so that the press can ask you questions thank you
right here. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I saw you yesterday. 